This is going to be the best storytelling channel on YouTube. And you can do your part to make it that way by liking and subscribing to this channel right now. Mount St. Helens in Washington state is famously known for its major eruption in 1980. But what you may not know is that before the eruption, it had a history mired in the paranormal. Around the turn of the century, it was common to hear reports of large, unearthly creatures roaming the hills surrounding the area. But one incident that has solidified itself as the penultimate Bigfoot encounter, second only to the incredible Patterson-Gimlin footage taken in the 60s, changed the lives of five prospectors forever, one of whom would, 40 years after the fact, go on to write a book about the historic event. That event is known today as the Ape Canyon Sasquatch Attack. Make sure to watch all the way to the end for the conclusion of this story. It's definitely worth it. And also make sure to stay tuned after the credits for a sneak peek at next week's Moonlit Tale. If you are enjoying these stories, please share this video and get the word out. Weekly Moonlit Tales just like this is only the beginning of what I'm planning for this channel. It's going to be amazing. I present to you now, without further ado, the Mountain Devils of Mount St. Helens. July 13, 1924, a strange article was printed in the Tacoma Daily Ledger. Gorillas found at St. Helens, it said in bold letters. The article described what prospectors Marion and Roy Smith, Fred Beck, Gabe Lefevre, and John Peterson would claim to be what culminated in an infamous encounter with what they called the Mountain Devils of St. Helens. It went on to describe a terrifying all-night assault these men endured while firing their guns wildly into the black of night from their small cabin to defend themselves. One man, Fred Beck, the paper claimed was knocked unconscious for about two hours during the assault. This, Beck would claim in his book, 40 years later that that never actually happened and that the papers didn't get all the details exactly right. The men described according to the article that these beasts were seven feet tall, covered in dark hair, and had tracks up to 19 inches long. And what's interesting is they also reported ears that stood straight up like a dog's. This article was only the first to detail this event and it wasn't long before the story broke nationally, and some of the papers weren't so nice, making the prospectors out to be drunk old eccentric men, and the ape men merely men who drank too much hair tonic. The forest rangers investigated and claimed to have debunked their testimony by recreating their tracks with their own hands. Sometimes people do hoax things for attention, but in this case, if that's what these men were trying to do, it didn't go well for them. In fact, hoaxing Sasquatch rarely culminates in the type of publicity generally desired. It seems for some reason, the better the claim, the more enemies you make. Take Bob Gimlin and Patterson, for example. Over the years, many theories arose to explain the encounter in natural terms. One person went on to claim it was merely a group of youth atop the cliffs of the canyon who were throwing rocks into the canyon, not knowing that there were prospectors down below. This to me seems very unlikely in light of everything else that was reported during the incident. But regardless of whether their claim was true, what is true, is that they were not the only ones to have reported these beasts in the woods around Mount St. Helens. In fact, many others had seen them as well. A report from 25 years earlier by a blacksmith, James Spencer, told of a massive gorilla-like creature that had attacked his dogs while he was out trapping. The Ape Canyon event, however, in 1924, inspired many to come looking for the mythical beasts. After reading about the encounter, hunters from all over the world came to collect Bigfoot as their prize. The great ape hunt of 1924 was on. Over the years, the story twisted and turned, facts became distorted, and the men faded away into obscurity as the story morphed into mere legend. And after 40 years, Fred Beck, one of the prospectors who was there, finally decided to set the record straight. He wrote a book 
describing the events in great detail and correcting a lot of the newspaper articles titled, I fought the ape men of Mount St. Helens. He would have done the modern day YouTube algorithm proud. And in the introduction, he states, truth is stranger than fiction, but the strangeness comes from the clouds surrounding our minds not from the mystery itself. This is a profound sentiment, one I myself have thought often upon. It is a maxim spoken by someone who has spent a lot of time reflecting upon the mystery at hand, and in my humble opinion, not of someone who perpetrated a hoax decades earlier. He begins his story. He, along with several others, had been working around the area of Mount St. Helens since 1918 and had for years noticed odd things here and there while out in the rugged wilderness. Sometimes they'd come across the occasional large tracks that they couldn't identify and other times strange sounds that kind of irk them in the wrong ways. But nothing significant ever came of any of these occurrences, that is until the summer of 19. 24. Beck claims that he and four other prospectors were led to a gold mine by a local Indian that they nicknamed the Great Spirit. They built a cabin and started working the area near the Vander White Narrow Canyon Pass about two miles east of Mount St. Helens. And it's this very canyon that after this incident would take on the name Ape Canyon. And with the help of the Great Spirit, they had struck literal gold. It was a prospector's wildest dream come true, and all five men were especially excited about their prospects for the coming week. After they had gathered supplies from town and had trekked far into the wilderness near to their mine, Beck, struggling with a lingering toothache, reluctantly asked Hank if he would take him back into town for a potential dental emergency. Hank is a pseudonym for one of the men in the original group who didn't want his name revealed in the writing of the book. Hank replied shortly, God or the devil couldn't get me to leave this prospect. Poignant words preceding the horrifying event which would shortly come to pass. So Fred would have to endure the toothache for the time being. He understood why and ultimately worked through the pain. After days on the mountain, the group were starting to feel a little more on edge than normal. Uh, the common thumping and whistling sounds were getting more prevalent. It became less of some odd phenomenon to something very personal and bone chilling. A whistle would be heard on the top of the cliffs to the right, and then a second later, another whistle above their heads to the left. No matter where they went, an ominous thumping sound followed them around. It was like they were being mocked. It got so bad at one point, infighting broke out between the five men, as each man thought the others were actually playing pranks on them somehow. But, but no one was. It was coming from the woods all around them, and each man would rather believe that it was one of the other four than think it was some unknown entity just beyond their sight. It was unsettling to say the least, but they were there to get that gold, so they weren't about to leave anytime soon, regardless of how creepy it was. One evening, Beck joined Hank to fetch water from the spring, about 100 yards from their cabin. The two of them were already obviously on edge, so they didn't go anywhere without their guns. As they were nearing the spring, Hank suddenly yelled out, simultaneously raising his rifle. Fred looked up and the two of them saw on the other side of the canyon, about a hundred more yards away, a creature staring at them with deep, penetrating eyes. To Fred's estimate, it was about seven feet tall and it was covered in dark, black, and brown hair. It gazed at them for a moment and quickly darted behind a large tree. Hank, though, with his Remington automatic, kept it trained on the tree. He didn't flinch, and after a moment, the creature poked its head out to look. Hank fired three shots in rapid succession, tearing the bark of the tree to pieces. He missed, 
but the creature took off running with large bounds through the trees and brush. Fred raised his Winchester and took three shots himself, which also appeared to have missed their mark. The creature had vanished into the thicket. After composing themselves and making it back to camp, they explained to the others what had happened, why they heard gunshots, and all five reluctantly agreed that it would be in their best interest to leave first thing in the morning, despite not having finished their mining. The morning, however, wouldn't be soon enough. The night came and they closed up the cabin, which had no windows to the outside. They bunkered down for the night and they tried to get some sleep and things were quiet for a few hours. But suddenly at midnight, a large object smashed into the side of their cabin. It felt like an earthquake and it had torn a small hole through the outer wall where they could peek out of. While everyone else was fumbling about in the foggy stupor, trying to wake up and gather themselves, Hank already had his rifle in hand and was yelling at the others to get up and get their weapons. He was already peeking out through the space torn loose by what hit their cabin. And to his horror, dancing in the shadows, three of the beasts were running around outside in the dead of night, pounding on the ground, their chests and throwing rocks at their cabin. Beck recalled that although they only ever had eyes on three of them at a time, the great commotion outside sounded like they, there were dozens of them all around, running around and tormenting them. The creatures, the mountain devils as they called them, got more audacious and started pounding relentlessly on the cabin door to where Beck and Hank turned in a cold sweat, pointing their rifles at the door. At that moment, one of the creatures tore loose some more of the cabin where the original hole had been and taking Beck by surprise, reached in blindly, groping around at anything he could get a hold of. Beck yelled out as he came within inches of being nabbed by a giant, powerful hand, but it grabbed the handle of an ax instead. Instinctively, Beck grabbed the ax and started wrestling with the creature, trying to pull it away. Hank turned quickly and shot, nearly killing Beck in the process. The creature dropped the axe and retreated into the darkness. Hank then screamed out, If you leave us alone, we will leave in the morning and we won't come back. Desperately trying to convey his message in a way they might understand. Even though, thinking about it, it didn't make sense. How could these animals know what he was saying? The commotion outside we seated, and for a few moments there was peace, and all was still. All that could be heard was the heavy panting of the terrified men inside the cabin as they tried to process what was going on. But before they could relax for too long, another wave of stones bombarded their cabin, and the siege continued. Hank and Fred began again to return fire blindly into the night through the hole whenever a shadow crossed their sight. The torment would last all night long without ceasing thereafter and it would only come to a stop just as the morning light was peeking over the hills and into the narrow pass where the canyon was. After a long wait, they cautiously exited the cabin, packing only what they could fit into their packs and they left as quickly as they could, leaving about $200 worth of, e of gold and equipment behind, which in 2021 would be over $3,000. Just as they were leaving the canyon, Beck turned and looked, spotting one of the creatures standing high above in the canyons, looking at them as they were leaving. And maybe out of nothing more than sheer resentment, for the, for the torture that they endured all night long, he raised his gun and fired at the beast. He hit it. It jolted backwards and then it plunged over the side of the cliff and fell 400 feet to the jagged rocks below. With that, they left the canyon, which thenceforward would ever be known as Ape Canyon. On their way into town, shocked and exhausted, they made a pact with one another to not tell a soul about their experience. 
Everyone agreed enthusiastically that they would tell no one. But <laughs> obviously, that's not the case. You and I know that someone had to have said something. It was Hank. He let the cat out of the bag, or he let the Bigfoot out of the canyon when he reported the incident to the local rangers. At that point, it wasn't long until newspapers nationwide got a hold of the story and sank their creative teeth into it. The story of the wild ape men of Mount St. Helens was published to the world for everyone to critique and criticize as they may. Beck's book in chapter three turns from a fantastic story about attacking Sasquatches to something even more fantastic. He goes on to describe the prodigious and psychic events that led up to the terrifying encounter. For one, the Indian who led them there in the first place, Beck claimed, was not only nicknamed the Great Spirit, but was in fact an actual spirit who vanished before their eyes after Hank had cursed him out for leading them on a wild goose chase through the mountains. As he vanished, he said, the great spirit is above me. We are all of the great spirit. If we listen when the great spirit talks, because you have cursed the great spirit, you will be shown where your treasure is, but it will not be given you. A great mysterious arrow then appeared before them in, and it led them to a doorway in the mountain. This is where they camped out and mined for gold. And there was more gold in that spot than they had ever seen. It was a literal gold mine. Beck goes on to explain in great detail that the creatures that attacked them that historic night were in fact creatures that lived in a lower realm of existence, making them interdimensional <laughs> entities. And it's this fact as understood by him that emboldened him to claim that no one, no one will ever capture one of these creatures. Now, as already stated, several theories have been set forth to explain their story. And one theory that holds a little bit of weight, for me at least, is that the creatures they ran into were in fact members of an extremely isolated Native American tribe called the Seatic. George Totsky, member of the Klalem tribe, said, the Seatic are seven to eight feet tall with hair all over their bodies like bears. They are great hypnotists and also have the gift of ventriloquism, throwing their voices at great distances. He also said that they can imitate with great precision the language of birds. The only thing is that the Klalem tribe thought that the Seatic were long extinct. Essentially, if whatever attacked Beck and the others that night, if they were the Seatic, they would have been human. And indeed, Bigfoot might be human. Beck explained that at a different time, he saw another one of these creatures in the wilderness, stating, My brother and I were quartered in a tent. One night I heard a rustling outside, and I heard something pushing its way under our tent. A tall, hairy figure stood before us, watching us scared my brother, who afterwards said it was a large bear, but I have seen enough bears to know that it was no bear. There was nothing else he knew to call it. Now, if you are familiar with David Politis and his missing 411 books, this account might be familiar to you. Those who are searching for the missing often report seeing a bear running away from the, from the place of disappearance sometimes even with the children scooped up in their arms. And often the description of a bear just doesn't quite work. But that's what's reported. 
As Beck addressed in his book, usually the mind will provide in such a case what seems like the only logical answer, even though what is seen does not fit the explanation at all. They think they must find an answer in the manner they are accustomed to finding it, or the mind is not at rest. Unfamiliar things tend to disturb people, to learn of higher things of life. There must be a shaking of concepts. Man can then rise to a higher consciousness, which is really his natural state. He will begin to test things in the test tube of wisdom. Wisdom is the best medicine for mankind. Let me just ask you, forget about logic, forget about reason, just, just do these words sound like the words of an aging old con man trying to protect his story? I don't know. It's, it's profound. It's crazy. Let me tell you what I think. I think the easy way out for lots of people is to just consider it a wild tale, but too many people have seen them, and the evidence is piling up to definitively prove this. The same line of escapism of thought concerning phenomenal sightings of flying saucers, for example, is evident. A report recently showed that 5 million Americans claimed to have seen flying saucers. But these happenings that seem strange to people is serving a very useful purpose. It is causing more people to think. And that is a path in the right direction. These creatures are just one small mystery among many. Someday, more people will conceive that the greatest proportion of life is a mystery. And he will seek and find solutions to them. And then the mysteries will be unveiled in their purest form. And from that unveiling, man will find greater life. That wasn't me. That too was Fred Beck in 1967. But here is some cheesecake for all of you skeptics out there. I Fought the Eight Men of Mount St. Helens by Fred Beck was published when? In September of 1967. What does that mean? <laughs> you got it. It was published less than one month before Patterson and Gimlin filmed Patty herself cross Bluff Creek in California. Marketing stunt? Marketing ploy? <laughs> I am... I'm all over the place on this story. Either way, it's it's an amazing story. You should read the book. <sighs> More things in heaven and earth, I tell you. After my research, I give the story of Fred Beck. What do you think I'm gonna say? I am a big Bigfoot nerd. I'm gonna give it an eight on my scale of believability. Let me know if you agree with my analysis in the comments below or on my Discord, where there is an active conversation going on about this very account. And also, thank you so much for your support of this channel. As I already said, this is going to be the best storytelling channel on the internet, and I wanna make this my full-time job. And you can help me do that by supporting me on Patreon and getting your name right here next to these amazing people. Don't forget to comment the secret message, which is right there. And without further ado, Here's a sneak peek of the winners of the exclusive Moonlit Ghost Patreon poll, the Hands Possess Him painting. In 1972, William Stoneham painted the worst painting of all time. And if you are triggered by seriously creepy paintings of children and dolls, this episode is not for you. You should not tune in next Monday. Several, several owners who came into possession of this painting shortly thereafter died, and this continued to happen with uncanny consistency. Eventually, the painting disappeared for decades, but it reappeared one day on eBay in 2000, with the owner desperately trying 
to get rid of it. 